Hello everybody, it's that time. That's right, we are going to catch up on all five Mission Impossible movies before Mission Impossible Fallout hits theaters this weekend. And no, we're not going to do one of those intros that's like, Good morning, Mr. Hunt. This message will self-destruct your mission should you choose to accept it. It's hacky. It's been done. We are, however, recording this VO from inside a stealth jet that's attached to another jet that's attached to a helicopter that's carrying a vault containing the International Space Station. And that's going to self-destruct. But after the show. In the first Mission Impossible, Ethan Hunt is just a regular old agent of the Impossible Mission Force, or IMF, under the command of Jim Phelps. Their first mission? Track down a file listing every secret agent known as the Knock List. If that list gets out into the open, the names of our agents in every country in Eastern Europe will be up for grabs to the highest bidders. Unfortunately, someone gets the drop on the IMF team, and they all get taken out one by one. My team is dead! It turns out the list was a decoy to flush out a mole in the IMF with the code name of Job. And because he's the only one that survived, Ethan Hunt is now the prime suspect. So he uses some explosive chewing gum that Emilio Estevez gave him and gets away. Yeah, that's right, you heard me. Explosive chewing gum. That's what happens. The IMF mole had a plan to sell the knock list to a shadowy arms dealer named Max. Side note, if you're a fan of shadowy arms dealers just in general, Welcome to your new favorite franchise. Okay, so Ethan's plan is to impersonate the mole and track down Max to both clear his name and avenge his dead team. Ethan realizes Job refers to a Bible verse, not the Bluth, and uses that to establish communication with Max via a super 90s computer search montage. Right around this time, whoops, turns out that Ethan's not the sole survivor because an actually alive Claire Phelps shows up at the Prague safe house. Ethan delicately delivers with maximum sensitivity the tragic news about her husband's passing. Wake up, Claire, Jim's dead! They're dead, they're all dead! Claire sticks around and Ethan goes to meet Max, who turns out to be a lady? You are something of a paradox. In 1996, this was considered a shocking plot twist. Ethan promises to steal the real knock list for Max if she'll then deliver the actual IMF mold to him. Claire and Ethan recruit two disavowed agents to help them out. The knife-wielding professional, Krieger, and the hacking superstar, Luther Stickle. Together, they steal the knock list from deep inside CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia. <laughs> Close one. They pull it all off, get the knock list on a disc, and head to London. Ethan's brought the Bible along from the safe house in case he needs to send more super secret coded messages to Max or possibly Tom Hanks. And on second glance, he sees it was originally taken from the Drake Hotel in Chicago. The very hotel where Jim Phelps had told the team he'd just been staying right before the original mission began. Drake Hotel, Chicago. So Ethan figures out that Mr. Phelps is really the mole. Ethan's not so sure about Claire yet, so he keeps his mouth shut and he gives the knock list to Luther for safekeeping and also as an excuse to say knock list a few more times. It's just a really fun word. Knock list, knock list, knock list, knock list. Now you say it. Knock list. Knock list. Knock list. See? Sure enough, a not dead Jim Phelps shows up in London and tries to convince Ethan that Kittredge is the real mole. It was Kittredge. But Ethan doesn't go for it and he arranges for all the main characters to be aboard the same high speed train the next day. Ethan uses one of IMF's amazing identity swapping masks to impersonate Jim and fools Claire into revealing their whole plan. We take the money, Ethan takes the blame. You know, she really should have seen that coming. In this franchise, it's more likely that you're not talking to the person that you think you're talking to. Ethan smartly uses some fancy camera glasses to out Phelps as the mole. Good morning, Mr. Phelps. Phelps grabs Max's money, shoots Claire, and jumps onto the roof of the train. He's arranged to have Krieger, who's also a mole, pick him up in a helicopter, but it doesn't quite work out, and Phelps and Krieger are both killed by Chekhov's gum. Meanwhile, Kittredge gets the knock list back from Max, and Luther is reinstated as an IMF agent in good standing. Ethan momentarily thinks he's out of government work for good, but a new recording reveals that he's actually the new Mr. Phelps and has another assignment. And we're off to the sequel. Cue the Limp Biscuit sound alike. Mission Impossible 2 opens with Ethan on vacation, visiting his favorite perilous cliffs. He's interrupted by a new handler who is not Kittredge, but who has sent him a pair of talking sunglasses. Morning, Mr. Hunt. He's played by Anthony Hopkins. Also, his talking sunglasses explode. 
So while Ethan was on vacation, an old pal of his named Nikorovich attempted to deliver an extremely dangerous engineered virus named Chimera and its antidote into IMF's hands. Swanbeck wanted to send Ethan on this mission, but he was so busy doing very impressive things on a cliff that he sent IMF agent Sean Ambrose in Ethan's place. Ambrose actually impersonated Ethan for this mission using those very convincing masks along with a wearable chip that alters your voice. These will become standard issue in future installments. Sadly, it turns out Sean Ambrose is very, very evil. Instead of recovering Chimera, he killed Nikorovich and stole the samples for himself. Swanbeck tells Ethan to find a thief named Naya who used to date Ambrose and is their best hope of tracking him down. At first, Naya is hesitant to join Ethan's team, but then they bond over a shared fondness for car chases and they fall in love. Damn, you're beautiful. So Naya agrees to get back together with Ambrose and pass information on his plans back to IMF. And if you're thinking this sounds a lot like the Alfred Hitchcock movie Notorious, you're right, and we commend you on your knowledge of both the classics and films partially scored by Limp Biscuit. Ethan breaks into the headquarters of Biosite, the company that created Chimera, to destroy all the remaining samples of the virus and wipe it out once and for all. It should be mentioned right around this point, 80 minutes in, that the movie remembers that it's being directed by John Woo. Only one dose of Chimera remains, and Naya injects it into herself. So Ambrose can't get his hands on it and can't shoot her either. Meanwhile, Ethan bravely escapes into the night without his now deathly ill girlfriend. Okay, we're almost through this thing. Ambrose holds up at Biosite's Island Fortress, something that every drug company now owns. Johnson & Johnson's even has a submarine dock. Ambrose's plan is to take over Biosite, then use Naya to contaminate the entire planet with Chimera, so the demand for the antidote will skyrocket. You create the supply, Mr. McCloy. We've just created the demand. Capitalism, am I right? Ethan interrupts with birds and explosions and explosions of birds. And he manages to escape on a motorcycle carrying the priceless antidote, the key to Ambrose's fortune, taking out a lot of cars and Ambrose's guys in the process. Ambrose has set Naya loose on Sydney so she can contaminate the entire city, and she plans to jump off a cliff destroying Chimera forever. But Ethan's team finds her first and saves her. Ambrose chases Ethan down on a bike of his own and they have a final showdown on the beach. Ethan eventually takes Ambrose out and they inject Naya with the antidote Bellerophon just in time to save her. Let's get lost. And she does for the remainder of the series. But if you're a fan of Anthony Hopkins creepily manipulating Tandy Newton in complex labyrinthine ways through the use of proxies, may I recommend HBO's Westworld. Moving on to Mission Impossible 3. Sometime later, Ethan has said nah to Naya and fallen head over heels in love with Julia. The two of them are engaged, but he hasn't told her or any of their friends what he really does for a living. I start to track patterns. He's also given up on being an active field agent and has switched over to training new IMF recruits. This includes promising young upstart, Lindsay Ferris. Also, Swanbeck has died or quit IMF or married Kittredge and settled down in the country or something because Ethan has another new handler named Musgrave. He interrupts Ethan's engagement party with some disturbing news. It seems Ferris, now an IMF field agent, has disappeared while trailing an arms dealer named Owen Davian. Yes, another arms dealer. Can you believe it? Musgrave wants Ethan and a team to go in, gather any intel they can on Davian, and save Ferris. Mr. Rooney would not approve. Obviously, the team includes Luther, and also newcomers Declan and Zen. Ethan lies to Julia and heads off to Berlin. Ethan grabs Agent Ferris, and Zen collects some intel on Davian before she's interrupted by a grenade, but still gets away with some damaged goods. Ethan and Lindsay shoot their way out, but as they escape by helicopter, go, 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 go. they find out Davian implanted an explosive inside Lindsay's head. It's gonna detonate unless we try to charge it. That's what we're gonna no, do. No, Ethan, you zap it like that, you'll stop a heart. And I'll zap her again and bring her back. But it goes off before they can do anything. Okay, so remember Davian's laptops and stuff that Zen got out of the factory, but they were all damaged by the explosion? Well, a very clever technician named Benji still manages to pull some data from them. It's all got to do with the rabbit's foot. But what is the rabbit's foot? Well, it turns out J.J. Abrams made this movie, so we'll never really know. No, I don't have any idea what it is. But we do know that Davian plans to sell it and will be a charity benefit at the Vatican. So it's off to Rome. 
Oh, wait. First, Ethan and Julie get impromptu married, and we find out that Ethan's middle name is Matthew. Hereby take Ethan Matthew Hunt. This will almost definitely not be important later. Okay, Rome! <laughs> Ethan gets into the Vatican by scaling the walls and disguising himself as a priest. They make one of their patented Mission Impossible masks on site so Ethan can take Davian's place at the party. Ethan swaps places with Davian in the bathroom and exits with his briefcase. But only after giving the late, great Philip Seymour Hoffman an awesome scene where he plays Tom Cruise playing himself, stalling for time so his voice chip can kick in. <laughs> Ethan meets up with Zen and they escape, making it look as if Davian has died in a fiery explosion. Ethan tries to get Davian to give him more info about the rabbit's foot. And you're gonna tell us everything. He tries hard. What is the rabbit's foot? Unfortunately, Ethan gets no information, and Luther slips up and drops his real name. But that would only be bad if someone attacked the IMF team and Davian somehow escaped. Back on the ground, the IMF team is attacked, and Davian escapes. They even use a drone to fire missiles at Ethan Hunt, personally. Knowing that Davian knows who he actually is, Ethan tries to warn Julia, but her idiot brother Aaron Paul has already dropped the dime on where to find her. Look, it's all good, man. I told him I didn't know where you were, and Julia might, and he's just trying the hospital. Hello. So now she's kidnapped. Damn it, Jesse. Davian calls with a deal for Ethan. Wait. Julia's life for the rest. Wait. Just... wait. You have 48 hours before she dies. Hey, wait. He's basically good with this, but before he can pull off the heist, he's detained by the IMF. But not for long, because Musgrave sets Ethan free, and even mouths him directions for where he should start the search for the rabbit's foot in Shanghai, China. Take him to the holding cell. Musgrave also sends Ethan his team so they can plan the rabbit's foot heist together. According to the plans from Davian's briefcase, it's in a laboratory on the 56th floor of the Heng Shang Lu building. To get it, Ethan swings between a few skyscrapers, <laughs> nearly slides to his death down a glass rooftop, <laughs> parachutes out of a window, <laughs> It's way too low. And almost gets hit by a truck hanging over a busy highway. But he recovers the rabbit's foot intact. I knew he'd make it. Ethan arranges a meet with Davian to deliver the rabbit's foot and save Julia. The rabbit's foot. <laughs> Luther has reservations. You know they probably plan to kill you both. And he is correct. The moment he shows up, Ethan is drugged, has a detonator injected into his nose, ah! and is forced to watch as Davian shoots Julia in the head. Ah! It's a fake out though, it wasn't really Julia. Oh, and it turns out that Musgrave is a traitor and was working with Davian all along. I am tired of Earth, these people. I'm tired of being caught in the tangle of their lives. Ethan takes advantage of Musgrave being an idiot to get free, and with Benji's help, uses Musgrave's phone to find out where they're holding Julia. I need to trace the location of the last call made from this phone. He runs across a bridge to her. This takes a really long time. Like in movie running time, this is 18 bridges. He's still running. This is an unbroken shot of Tom Cruise just running. And I'm exhausted. Just as Ethan gets to Juliet, <laughs> Davian triggers the detonator in his head and takes advantage of his weakened state to beat him up. <laughs> Ethan overcomes the pain and still manages to kill Davian. <laughs> R.I.P. PSH. We miss you. Ethan frees Julia and has her zap him with a power line to fry the charge in his brain. While he's unconscious, she takes out a henchman and Musgrave and recovers the rabbit's foot. Plus, she brings Ethan back to life with the power of her nursing. He tells her everything. I work for an agency. It's called IMF. And they all share happy ending hugs. Well, except for Felicity. She's dead. Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, or as I like to call it, MIGP, opens with Ethan locked in a Moscow prison. Why? Uh, it's complicated, we'll circle back to it. Ethan's totally cool doing his Steve McQueen thing in jail, but the IMF has other ideas, and they engineer a breakout. Ethan escapes, but insists on also breaking out his prison buddy, Bogdan. Fed me intel. If I left him there, they would have killed him, so we're going to give him his freedom. They didn't just break Ethan out to be nice, though. If the secretary wanted me out of there, it must be pretty bad out here. The IMF needs his help. 
now field agent Benji and new team member Carter were working on another operation in Budapest with Sawyer from Lost. I mean, Agent Sawyer from Lost MF. <laughs> Sawyer was tracking a man carrying Russian nuclear launch codes. He recovered them, but was shot and killed <coughs> before the rest of his team could get there. Before he died, Sawyer's fancy eyeball camera identified his killer. Speed room, contract killer. Works for diamonds. Wait, she only works for diamonds? Now yeah, whatever, something something assassin's best friend. The team figures out that she plans to sell the nuclear codes to somebody known only as Cobalt. He's determined to detonate a nuclear weapon however he can. We know Moreau's worked for him before. So their new assignment is to break into the Kremlin and steal some files to find out more about this Cobalt. So they do. Benji and Ethan pose as generals, and they use a fancy projector screen to fool the security guards and access the vault. Then everything just goes straight to hell. The Cobalt files are already gone. The nest is empty. But even worse, Cobalt, who's actually a guy named Kurt Hendricks, has also broken into the Kremlin himself, piggybacking on the IMF mission. Check in, team leader. Over. But instead of some file that's not even there, he's stealing a nuclear launch device. To make things even worse while pretending to be part of IMF, Hendricks detonates a huge bomb that blows the Kremlin apart. Away to your go sign. <laughs> So now the Russian authorities think IMF bombed them on behalf of the U.S. government. We both know that the real cause of the explosion was you. Ethan gets away from the cops and is picked up by the secretary of IMF along with his top analyst, Brandt, who is Jeremy Renner. Also, Brandt is Philip Seymour Hoffman's name in The Big Lebowski. Again, we miss you, PSH. The Kremlin attack has caused the president to activate Ghost Protocol, which disavows the entire IMF agency, but still allows Ethan and his team to continue working unsanctioned to try to find Cobalt. But before he can even finish the assignment, the caravan is attacked and the secretary is killed. Man, Tom Wilkinson got more screen time in the Dark Knight franchise than this one. Is that right? Maybe Fast and Furious can find something for him. Ethan and Brant get away. The secretary has directed them to a secret stocked IMF train car where Benji and Jane are waiting. The secretary's instructions point the team to Dubai. Moreau, the assassin, plans to sell the nuclear launch codes to one of Hendrick's men, Wistrom, at the famous, very, very tall Burj Khalifa Hotel. Our objective is to intercept the sale, place the authentic codes with counterfeits, and follow Wistrom. To pull off the mission, they hold two separate meetings. Moreau and Wistrom think they're meeting one another, but Moreau's actually meeting Ethan, and Wistrom is actually meeting Carter. Everybody got that? There will be a pop quiz later. <laughs> for all of it to work, Benji needs to control the elevators, and for that to work, Ethan has to scale the side of the building using gravity-defying Astro Gloves, in a scene that will make you wish you were watching this in IMAX instead of on your phone. For complicated reasons we don't need to get into, they actually end up using a real copy of the actual nuclear launch codes in the fake deal. Which is a problem because Wistrom gets out of the hotel with the help of a massive sandstorm. And just as Wistrom is escaping, he pulls back a mask to reveal that he was actually Hendrix all along. Again, why are we ever surprised that somebody pulls off a mask in this franchise and reveals that they are not the person they say that they are? So Hendrix has a launch device and launch codes, but now he needs a satellite to actually launch a nuke, a satellite owned by Indian telecom billionaire Brijnath. We have to shut it down before he gets that chance. So it's off to India, but first, Brant tells Benji and Jane some super hot IMF goss. It seems that he was working a mission in Croatia monitoring Ethan and Julia Hunt. Remember Julia from the last movie? And Julia, get this, was killed. So what happened to the husband? Never saw him again. Until two days ago in Moscow, when the secretary introduced me to Ethan Hunt. This apparently caused Ethan to snap and murder the entire Serbian hit squad responsible, which is what landed him in that Russian jail. Where were we? Oh yeah, Mumbai. The plan is for Brant to jump into the computer room wearing a magnetic suit, because at this point in the Mission Impossible franchise, nothing is too ridiculous. But in what is a running theme for this installment, the plan completely does not work. Impossible missions, remember? Hendrix is one step ahead of them and put a virus in the... downloaded... uploaded the uplink satellite to... He did a computer thing. Uplink to satellite, reboot to original military specs. Download the virus. 
Ethan is now racing to get to Hendrix and the nuclear launch device. But the missile's already launched and it's headed for San Francisco. Ethan figures he can still redirect or even stop the missile if he gets that briefcase. We're gonna get that case. So he chases Hendrix through the streets of Mumbai and into an automated parking garage. Is that a thing? We don't have those in the States. Hendrix flings himself down the length of the structure with the briefcase rather than letting Ethan get it. So Ethan drives a car down after him, like you do. <laughs> Everything comes together just in the nick of time to save San Francisco and with it, the day. Back in the States, Ethan introduces Brant to Luther, who has no interest in either ghosts or protocols, and shocks him by revealing that his wife Julia is actually alive. Her entire death was a ploy by Ethan to protect Julia from his enemies and get him thrown into that Russian jail where he could meet Bogdan, who had information on Hendrix. That makes sense, right? I can't really remember anymore. Anyway, Ethan and Julia share a meaningful glance, knowing that they can never truly be together while Ethan lives the dangerous life of an IMF field agent. But before we wrap this one up, there's a little lead into the next film. As Ethan walks away, he listens to a recording laying out his next mission. Now an emerging terror organization known as the Syndicate has control of our entire drone fleet. Sure enough, Mission to Possible Rogue Nation opens with Ethan, Benji, Luther, and Brant hot on the trail of the Syndicate, which is in the process of transporting some rockets containing VX nerve gas. That plane cannot take off with the package on it. You understand? Ethan jumps on the plane and hangs on for dear life until they can get that trailer shot, and then Benji hacks the doors open. Benji, open the door! And Ethan manages to recover the weapons. But when he goes to a London record shop to covertly report back to IMF, the Syndicate turns the tables on him. We are the Syndicate, Mr. Hunt, and now we know who you are. Ethan is neutralized with knockout gas. The Syndicate's founder, Solomon Lane, shoots the nice girl who ran the record shop and Ethan is taken to a dungeon and tortured. Meanwhile, back in DC, CIA Director Hunley believes you should A, B, C, A always, B, B, C closing the IMF for good. Time has come to dissolve the IMF. Mr. Chairman. And transfer their salvageable assets to the CIA. Back to Ethan. He's in real trouble. Yannick Vinter, they call you the bone doctor. Until he's set free by British undercover agent Ilsa Faust the least British name for any British person I've ever heard. She's working undercover as an assassin with the Syndicate. We've never met before, right? Ilsa helps Ethan escape, but stays behind to finish her assignment. Also, can we roll it back real quick? Are those like vertical sit-ups? How does Tom Cruise do that? He's 56 years old. That's insane. I'm sorry, that's just a quick moment of Tom Cruise appreciation. Where were we? We didn't kill them, you did. I tried to stop you. You got away. Right, so Ethan calls Brant for help, but finds out that the IMF has been totally dissolved by Congress. There is no more IMF. I've been ordered to bring everyone in. So he disappears for six months, which he spends tracking Ilsa and Lane, along with other syndicate operatives. It turns out they're all former spies who have been labeled as disavowed or dead. Benji, who now has a boring CIA desk job, gets a letter in the mail containing free tickets to the Vienna Opera. And sure enough, when he shows up, it's actually a secret assignment from Ethan. Welcome to Vienna, Benji. Miss me? Benji will use his special camera glasses to scan for Lane, whom Ethan believes will be in the crowd. You find him. We tag him. I follow him wherever he goes. And sure enough, he's there, apparently coordinating the assassination of the Chancellor of Austria. And one of the assassins turns out to be... Ilsa? That blows. Ethan shoots the Chancellor to save his life and escapes with Ilsa, whom he's now deduced is a double agent. The Chancellor still dies, though. Turns out the assassination was a test for Ilsa, which she failed. And the car bomb was insurance. Ilsa still wants to go back undercover, so she pulls a ladybird and pretend escapes from Ethan, but leaves a tube of lipstick behind containing a secret flash drive. This leads Ethan and Benji to Morocco, where Ilsa is waiting. She says she's been tasked by Lane with stealing a disc, which a former operative stole from him. Lane had a ledger. It contained the identities of his operatives, 
his terrorist associates the entire inner workings of the syndicate. As with all valuable discs slash information slash viruses in this franchise, it's kept in a super high-tech facility that requires Ethan to manually tamper with the security systems, which are located in a separate vault underwater. Ethan manages to do it, Benji gets through and downloads the ledger, but Ethan nearly drowns and Ilsa has to jump down after him and save him. Things are momentarily looking up. I misjudged you. But then Ilsa grabs the ledger and makes a break for it. Benji and Ethan go after her, but Ethan's not exactly at 100% just yet. Are you okay to drive? I mean, a minute ago you were dead. What are you talking about? There's a long chase involving motorcycles and cars, and Ethan and Benji meet up with Luther and Brant, who have come to warn them that the CIA is planning to kill them. Ilsa gets away with the ledger, but... Of course I made a copy. However, when Benji and Luther try to access the ledger, they discover it's been super encrypted and can only be accessed by the actual Prime Minister of England. We have to take the Prime Minister. We're gonna steal the Prime Minister of England. Wait, sorry, sorry, wrong franchise. Lane kidnaps Benji as a way of forcing Ethan and his team to snag the Prime Minister and unlock the flash drive for him. Ethan does by using his trusty Mission Impossible mask and finds out the dark truth. The Syndicate was actually formed by British intelligence, and it's now being operated by Solomon Lane as a rogue nation of former agents who want to run the world their way. We know you created the Syndicate, but Lane went rogue and turned it against you. Alec Baldwin's all like, hey man, I believe you now, sorry for trying to kill you, and Ethan memorizes all of the information on the disc before destroying it, which turns out to be the bank account information for the syndicate to operate for decades. Its operating budget was to be hidden offshore in a virtual red box, which I alone would control. So now Ethan Hunt is the only person that has the bank account numbers that Solomon Lane so desperately seeks. I am the disc. I memorized it on 2.4 billion in numbered accounts. Lane tries to outwit Ethan by strapping a bomb to Benji, but it backfires when he finds out that if he kills Ethan, all of his money goes bye-bye. Without me, you're nothing. So, the bomb gets disarmed, the agents escape, and then they find Lane, who they seal up into an actual glass cage of emotion. Mr. Lane. Meet the IMF. And this pretty much puts all the pieces in place for Mission Impossible Fallout. Solomon Lane is in custody for his many, many international crimes. The Syndicate has no leader, but apparently does have a network of disavowed agents still on the loose. Ilsa Faust has given up the spy life. The IMF has been reformed with Hunley as the new secretary. Ethan and his team are still in the field. Ethan's true love, Julia, is keeping a low profile for her own protection. And Felicity is, well, she's still dead. Sorry, Felicity. Anyway, that's our rundown of all five Mission Impossible movies to this point. And if you think this was long, hey, we just saved you like 11 hours of watching actual movies. So, you know, it's a kind of a trade-off. Let us know what you think below. Tell us if we missed out any detail. I'm sure we did because these things are jammed with impossible to remember details. And as always, thanks for watching.